I'll never forget a debate that I had with a guy by the name of James White. He is a Reformed Baptist. He's debated, I don't know, a billion people, maybe more. And uh, I did two debates with him. The first one was on the topic, does the Bible teach sola scriptura? And during the cross-examination period, I think he thought this is where he was going to really get me because he said, Mr. Madrid, can you show us any tradition, anything that's not in the Bible that is necessary for us as Christians, that we must have that's necessary, even one thing? And I think he was expecting me to say something about Our Lady or maybe purgatory or something like that. And so with theatrical Flair. I just placed my Bible in front of him, and I said, here you go, Mr. White, the canon of the New Testament. The canon of the New Testament. Those 27 books from Matthew to Revelation, and there's nowhere in the Bible that tells you that those books belong in the New Testament. As Scott Hahn said long ago, I've never forgotten it, there's no inspired table of contents in the Bible. The Bible itself does not furnish you with that information, does it? It doesn't say which books belong. So just taking the New Testament, you can ask the question, how did these books get here? Who decided? And it's interesting when you see how the other person might see for the very first time that there's more to the story than just saying, I go by the Bible alone. In fact, the truth is, he wouldn't even have a Bible if it were not for the Catholic Church through whom God revealed that these scriptures were inspired. As it says in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scriptures inspired by God, not by the Catholic Church. We don't claim that it's the Catholic Church. We do claim, however, that the Bible does not tell us which books belong in it. Therefore, how do we know this? We know this from the trustworthy testimony of the very church that people say is not trustworthy to interpret the books in the Bible that the church determined should be in the Bible, if that makes any sense to you. The next one would be to talk about um, the interpretation of the Bible, and that would fall into this category of questioning authority. A quick example I, love, I have a very fond memory of one evening after a talk in San Diego. There were two Calvinist fellows who came up to me and, and they said, you know what, almost everything you said tonight is wrong. And we would like, if you would be willing to meet with us for coffee, we'd like to show you from the Bible why you're wrong. I had given a talk on Our Lady. So I thought, you know, to me, this is like, Excellent. Thank you. Yes, I do want to do this. Some people like to watch TV. Some people collect stamps. I like to talk to people like that. And so we went to a Denny's. I don't know why I was drinking coffee at 930 at night, but I, I did. And so picture the scene. So the two fellows are on that side of the booth. I'm on this side of the booth. They have their Bibles open. I have my Bible open. And they started off by saying something like, well, you interpreted the Bible, uh, or you, you are adding doctrines to the Bible that aren't there. You're adding doctrines about Mary's sinlessness and her bodily assumption, things like that. That's unbiblical. And I said, oh, really? Any particular one you want to talk about? So they threw one out. Might have been Mary's perpetual virginity. So I, I opened to the passages in the Bible that speak to this topic, and I began to share from the Bible why I believe in that doctrine. And it, their argument changed from you're, you're being unbiblical and you're adding doctrines that don't belong in the Bible. So as soon as I started quoting scripture to them, then they shifted and said, you're misinterpreting that. And I said, no, I'm not, you are. They said, no, we're not, you are. I said, no, I'm not, you are. <laughs> and for the better part of an hour, the whole conversation was like that. It was very frustrating for all of us because I wasn't giving an inch, they weren't giving an inch, and it just was unproductive. They weren't getting anywhere with me and I wasn't getting anywhere with them. So I had this idea and I, I took a pen out of my pocket and I took the napkin on the table and I wrote six words on it. And if you're taking notes, you might wanna write them down. The words I wrote on the napkin were, I never said you stole money. And then I turned the napkin in front of the two guys and I said, okay, you just saw me write this in our common language of English. I wrote it in your presence. Do you understand what I mean by this? And they looked at it and said, sure. I never said you stole money, I understand it. And I said, are you sure you understand? And they said, yes, of course. Then for 
emphasis, I said a third time, are you sure you understand what I mean by this? And they said, of course we do. What is your point? I said, well, my point is, did I mean, I never said you stole money, suggesting that somebody else said it. Did I mean, I never said you stole money? I thought it, but I never actually said it. Or did I mean, I never said you stole money? Somebody else did. Or did I mean, I never said you stole money? Maybe you accidentally lit it on fire. I don't know. I didn't say you stole it. Or did I mean, I never said you stole money? Maybe you stole something else. So I said, which of these five distinct meanings did I intend when I wrote the six words on the napkin? Can you tell me? And they just sort of, you know, shrugged. It's like, oh, all right, parlor trick. You got us on this one. And I said, well, it's not a parlor trick. It's an honest question. And I held up my Bible. I said, you're telling me that you are automatically guaranteed to accurately understand the meaning of these passages in Scripture, whatever they may be, and that you're going to be correct in your understanding of them, and I, as a Catholic, will necessarily be wrong? And yet you can't tell me what I meant by six words written on a napkin? How does that work? And that's when the conversation came to a conclusion. I don't remember who paid for the coffee, but I do remember <laughs> that that's where things sort of ground to a halt. Well, here's the, the happy ending to that story. Months later, maybe six months later, one of the two guys, he was the former Catholic, by the way, he shows up at another event that I was at. And he says, hey, you remember me? I said, I sure do. And he said, do you remember that napkin thing you did? I said, yeah, I remember that. He says, well, I, that was like a key unlocking a locked door of my mind because I was a former Catholic and I was no way ever going to consider the Catholic Church. But when you did that little, I never said you stole money thing, it got me to thinking, maybe he's got a point. Maybe there's a different interpretation than what, I'm, than what I believe. And he said he turned to the church fathers to see what they said. And he said, that's all she wrote. And it didn't take long before he found his way back to the Catholic Church. And it all happened because of six words on a napkin. Isn't that amazing?